EBS Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm Rochelle Travers and this is The Leader. The court unanimously concludes that the proposed bill does relate to reserved matters. Accordingly, in the absence of any modification of the definition of reserved matters, by an order in council under section 30 of the Scotland Act or otherwise, the Scottish Parliament does not have the power to legislate for a referendum on Scottish independence. Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, says the next national election will be a de facto vote on Scottish independence after the Supreme Court's landmark decision on Indy Ref 2. The route we take must be lawful and democratic for independence to be achieved. And as is becoming clearer by the day, achieving independence is not now just desirable, it is essential. The UK's highest court concluded that the Scottish Parliament does not have the power to hold a second independence referendum. The Scottish Government's top law officer, the Lord Advocate, asked for a ruling on whether Holyrood could legislate for the vote. The panel of five justices were unanimous in their decision. It's potentially a defining moment for the Union, establishing a constitutional precedent with ripple effects that could be felt for years to come. Tristan Kirk is the court's correspondent for the Evening Standard. This was a decision, a, a hand down of the, the ruling after a, a legal argument and battle that had gone on previously. And there were a lot of people who had taken part in, in the legal battle who were actually present in, in the court to hear what had gone on. On one side, there is the United Kingdom government and lawyers representing them. And on the other side are the, uh, the legal representatives for the Lord Advocate, the top legal officer in the Scottish government, as well as people representing the Scottish National Party. And obviously they have uh, a lot of vested interest in this decision and the way that this case went. Um, Obviously from the SNP's side, disappointment at what the court had decided, but no, by no means the, the end of the road for them. Was this ruling expected? I think that there probably was a, a large degree of expectation that this is the way that it was it would go. Um, this was a case that was brought to test the law by the Lord Advocate to say, uh, we're not sure that we have the power to bring a bill to the Scottish Parliament to essentially to, to trigger a referendum, a second referendum on independence. And so they sought the uh, the ruling from the Supreme Court, I think probably expected that it might go this way, because their referendum touches on um, essential parts of of our constitution, uh, the way that the the Union of the United Kingdom is is made up and, and created, and also the sovereignty of the UK Parliament. And I think it was a very tight argument to try and try and get through that the referendum, if it ever happens, it is not legally binded and it would automatically trigger Scottish independence and therefore it's not a matter that should be handled by the UK government. I think that uh, those venturing that argument would have known that it was probably not going to be successful. Tristan, just explain the crux of this. How did they reach this decision and why exactly does the Scottish Parliament not have this power? Well, devolution, when it was when it was put through, um, gave a lot of powers to the Scottish Parliament for them to be able to self-govern and, and take those decisions themselves. But there were certain matters that were held back, certain reserved matters that could only be approved by the United Kingdom government and, and the, the UK Parliament. And some of those issues related to the way that the union is made up of uh, Scotland. England, Wales and, and Northern Ireland, and also the the, uh, the sovereignty of the UK Parliament must be absolute. And there are, if there were issues that were being considered um, in some of the devolved parliaments that touched on uh, the issue of sovereignty, then those must come back to Westminster. And so that was the way the devolution was done, to ensure that although there are devolved powers, that uh, if there are issues that are fundamental to the way that this country is made up uh, and the way that our constitution runs, then those are ultimately decided in Westminster. And so what what was proposed or what was being proposed is is a a bill to go before the Scottish Parliament to approve uh, a new referendum on independence for Scotland and for that then to be put to a vote. But uh, as it 
was properly pointed out by the Scottish law officer and was confirmed by today's ruling, that's not something that the Scottish Parliament is allowed to do under law because of the way that devolution and the devolved powers worked out. Is this the end of the road for Indy Ref 2 in the courts or could there be other legal challenges? I think with uh, an issue such as Scottish devolution, independent referendums uh, and the like, I'd be very surprised if we don't end up back in the courts at some point in the future because, I mean, these are issues of, of huge magnitude for the country. They go into issues of constitutional law where you can imagine all all manner of uh, number of challenges um, that might be, be thrown up. I mean, you only have to look at the prorogation of Parliament uh, a few years ago when, when we were looking at um, uh, Brexit to see how we can frequently end up in the courts when we're, we're dealing with, with issues of, of such a huge nature. This particular challenge, however, this is this is pretty much the end of the road for it. It was referred to the Supreme Court. Uh, it hasn't travelled up through the various lower courts. It was referred directly to the Supreme Court for them to decide the issue. And, and today's ruling is, is pretty final on that. If they want a Scottish referendum on independence to happen, it must be approved um, through a, a legal instrument by the UK Parliament. Is this a defining moment for Scottish independence? I don't think this is a defining moment. and I don't think anybody um, involved in this will, will have seen it as, as such. This was, in, in essence, although a big moment in the Scottish independence campaign, it was, it was a legal question that was being determined as to who could trigger a referendum and ultimately who couldn't. Um, now, this is this. Let's make no mistake about this. This is this is a bad day for the SNP and for their campaign because it means that they can't unilaterally on their own it just trigger a referendum, uh, push it through the Scottish Parliament, and then put a vote to the public. They have to uh, go cap in hand to the government in Westminster and to the UK Parliament and convince everybody that, as in 2014 uh, when David Cameron was the Prime Minister, that a referendum should take place by consent it should be allowed and it should be put to the people there's clearly a vast chasm has grown uh, in the two different sides since 2014 as to whether there should be a, a second referendum or whether the first one that was it and so today's ruling is is a big deal not because it settles any issues not because it ends the debate but because it means that the power as to whether there's a vote at all is firmly shifted over to Westminster and and taken out of the hands of the the SNP and the Scottish Parliament. Let's go to the ads. Stay there to hear from our Deputy Political Editor, David Bond, about the political fallout from this decision. Welcome back. David Bond is the Evening Standard's Deputy Political Editor. Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister of Scotland, tweeted almost immediately after the decision by the Supreme Court that she was disappointed by it, said the Supreme Court doesn't make law, only interprets it. Uh, A law that doesn't allow Scotland to choose our own future without Westminster consent exposes as myth any notion of as a voluntary partnership and makes the case for Indy, as in Indy referendum. So I think what you're seeing there is the beginnings of plan B. So plan A was to try and get a ruling from the UK Supreme Court, which went in the Scottish government's, the SNP's favour, but now it hasn't. She will move to plan B, which will be to say, look, Westminster is denying our right to have a referendum on this. And she will look to make the 2024 general election, if indeed it comes in 2024, which we expect it will, into a one-issue debate, a question of whether Scotland should be allowed another independence referendum or not. In fact, she later went on to tweet, Scottish democracy will not be denied. Today's rule is one route to Scotland's voice being heard on independence, but in a democracy, our voice cannot and will not uh, be silent. So it's pretty clear there, clear statement of intent from Nicola Sturgeon. David, you mentioned Nicola Sturgeon will be looking at plan B now. What are her options? Well, I think it is that make the general election whenever it comes, and we all anticipate it has to come by um, early 2025, January 2025, uh, and you will have the SNP standing on, on, on one issue. And critics of Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP say is that, well, look, 
you know, that would ignore all the other major things that are going on, uh, not just in the UK, but in Scotland specifically. So around the economy, cost of living crisis, the state of the NHS in Scotland, all of these things will be brushed aside as Nicola Sturgeon tries to make uh, the election a one issue election, which will be about whether it is a, effectively a referendum on Scottish uh, independence. Difficult to see how that will go at this stage. Not sure where public opinion is. The feeling has been for some time that Scottish public opinion is moving away from independence. But you know, if you think about it, this is what the SNP are for. And you know, it really underlines this fault line in, in politics in the UK that the SNP are so dominant north of the border, so dominant in Scotland, effectively calling for a breakup of the union. For Rishi Sunak, of course, it strengthens his hand uh, on the whole question of the union and the last thing he would have needed uh, given everything else on is the prospect of a referendum next october the supreme court has uh, ended that possibility today what is rishi sunak and nicola sturgeon's relationship like and how do you see that developing certainly better than it was between nicola sturgeon and boris johnson and nicola sturgeon and liz truss you'll remember that there was a slightly uh, sort of wash, waspish comments uh, on both sides, uh, I think that on the whole, there is there's likely to be a much more professional, uh, cordial relationship between Rishi Sunak and Nicola Sturgeon. But ultimately, you know, they are on uh, different sides of the argument. And uh, as I say, Rishi Sunak uh, will be desperate to avoid a big row over the union, given all the other things facing his government with the economy looming, you know, looking like going into a looming recession in the next uh, few months, the cost of living crisis, you know, waves of strikes. You know, the last thing that he wants and that the government wants is a big row over over the breakup of, of the UK. So, you know, the UK government's argument is, look, there are bigger things to worry about than a divisive debate over the future of the union at the moment. And the Supreme Court ruling definitely helps in them. Uh, on that argument. Do you think there'll ever be a definitive conclusion about IndyRef 2 or is this just going to continue to rumble on? I think it will just continue to rumble on. I mean, today's about as definitive as you could have hoped for from the Supreme Court. It's very clear that it's up to the Westminster government. It's not in uh, the gift of the Scottish government to uh, make it a decision on whether to hold a referendum or not. But, you know, as you see, from Nicola Sturgeon's response, democracy, as she says it, uh, will not be denied. So I think this just gives her the opportunity, the platform to say, look, Westminster is denying us our, our right. So in a way, it gives more fuel to their argument. But as I say, you know, there is no obvious way for her to actually make it happen. And that's it from The Leader. This podcast is back tomorrow at 4pm. <laughs>